Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Chartership Housing and Cash web, web, webinar that's taking place uh, for the next hour. My name is Ken Gibb, and I'm the director of the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence based at the University of Glasgow, and I'm going to chair uh, today's uh, event. So I'm going to start just with a little introduction to a little bit about background to the event today and also how we're going to run it. OK, so back in 2014, there was legislation passed which made provision for the regulation of letting agents in Scotland to improve the standards of service for those renting properties for letting, from letting agents and requiring appropriate people in each letting agency to hold a relevant qualification and where necessary undertake additional training uh, uh, on letting agency work. So we passed the first period of registration in 2021 and the Chartered Institute of Housing, uh, funded by Safe Deposit Scotland's Charitable Trust, commissioned a review of the existing qualification and training requirements for let let letting agencies. So that three years after a new system was introduced, the Chartered Institute of Housing wanted to determine what, if any, difference the new system of regulation had made. And the report has been, uh, and the research has been carried out by Anna, Anna Evans at Indigo House. So uh, in this event, we're going to do three things, essentially. Ask to the extent to which the new system has enhanced and professionalised practice by let letting agencies. Second, how it can be further improved for letting agents and tenants. And third, what lessons are there for other parts of the rented sector, for instance, the social rented se sector. So that's the kind of ambition of the next hour. And uh, we're going to run this in the kind of structure that we've used in a few of these events recently, which is to say we're going to have three structured discussions. We've got six speakers who will make small five minute contributions. And in each case, we'll have two speakers. They'll speak for the five minutes each. We'll then have a, a dialogue between them and myself. Uh, and then we'll move on to the second set of speakers and we'll do the same. And then the third set of speakers and we'll do, do the same. Time is rather tight and we want to get a lot of these different views across and provide room for that discourse between the, uh, the uh, presenters. So we're not proposing to have uh, questions from the floor directly, but I would strongly encourage those of you who wish to, to put questions into the Q&A that's on this uh, Zoom page. So simply type in the, in the Q&A section what question you'd like to ask. I can't promise that we'll get to them all, but we will, we will have a look at them and we will do, do our best. So without further ado, I'd like to move, move on to our first uh, couple of uh, presenters. And they are Callum Chomchuk from the uh, Chartered Institute of Housing in Scotland, and also Anna Evans, who's the lead author of the uh, report that we're here to discuss. So I'm gonna start by asking uh, Callum to tell us about the context for the project. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. And sorry, echo what you said. Then thanks to Anna and Indigo House for um, conducting the report, and to Safe Deposit Trust, uh, Charitable, Safe Deposit Scotland, for Charitable Trust for funding the research. So you kind of set it out there quite uh, neatly, there, Ken. I actually, you know, the whole point behind the research was the you know, letting agent sector is interesting in Scotland. It is the only part um, of the housing sector where we have the CPD and qualification qualification requirements. Obviously relatively small in the context of the whole housing sector, but it's a still an incredibly important part of the housing sector. So it was a new requirement. The first registration period, as I said, concluded in 2021. And we had this interest. We were interested, we're a professional body, so we're interested in, in what extent has CPD and qualifications actually improved professional practice? We at CIH, we talk about the importance of all the time, but actually we want to have evidence. We want to have demonstrable evidence that gives confidence to practitioners, to landlords, to government, to the whole sector that is worthwhile investing in CPD and education to improve performance. So that, that was at the heart of it. I think beyond that as well, it seems quite a while ago now, but even just a couple of years ago, the Scottish government were talking a lot about alignment between the renting sectors, talking about kind of alignment between the renting sector, the private renting sector and the social renting sector. And we were mindful, as you kind of set out um, in your introduction, about kind of, actually, could there be a crossover? Uh, if there's lessons from the private renting sector and, and the letting age sector in particular, are the government interested in applying that to the rest of the private renting sector or the social renting sector? And we recognise, wow, an evidence base, that would never happen. So that was sort of the context for commissioning this work and asking Anna and the team Indigo House to go ahead with it. 
I suppose beyond that, I'd, I'd maybe just reflect on where we are um, on housing education. Um, and anyone who's heard me talk about a housing education on a strategic level won't be surprised by this, but you know, Housing in 2040, which was released two years ago, really says nothing. It says nothing about housing education. It says nothing about professional practice and CPD and qualifications and developing people. And I think that's disappointing. I think it's disappointing to look at housing in, only in the context of the built environment, because we talk a lot about being more in bricks and mortar, and maybe people think about that as just tenants, but it's also about staff, it's about those working in it, and that's mindful. So that's perhaps on the negative side. However, more positively, we are seeing lots of more and more people actually take up qualifications. We're seeing it through our CIH Housing Academy, the other centres across the UK will be experiencing the same, undoubtedly. So there is that positive case to it. Also, um, quite interestingly, the UK government, kind of led by Michael Gove and his department, had been looking at a case for mandatory qualifications in the social rental sector, recognising that actually having an educational base could be a real driver of improved practice, improved performance and better tenant outcomes in England. Now, that, that, hasn't, that hasn't been finally determined. It may be they fall short of that. But ultimately, there's that discussion going on around the importance of education in the housing sector, something I think has been missing. Um, and finally, I suppose I would just, um, before I pass over Anna, just to say, before we get, Anna will talk about the conclusions, but I think there's a lot we can do to progress these without even the, the government leading on. I think there's, there's a lot of really positive recommendations in there for organisations like CIH. How do we improve the kind of CPD offering? How do we improve access to CPD? For letting agent sector, I think there's a challenge also to the to the rest of the rent sector, private rent sector and social rent sector about how they can communicate the value for those you know, watching this today, those who are studying qualifications, how they can be great advocates for the value of housing education, how they can make the case for it. But ultimately, I think for anybody watching this today, their interest in education, we all have a, co a collective interest in promoting education, and I think there's opportunities with the housing bill later this year about making the case for uh, uh, some more national leadership when it comes to requiring education or CPD requirements in, and I would stress this, in a proportionate sense. Uh, and I will conclude there, Ken, so thank you. Thank you very thank much, Cal. And apologies if you heard our fire alarm going off a few minutes ago. That, that tells me the great centre is Thursday morning, so that's good, good, good to know. Uh, all right, th thanks very much, Cal. I'll, I'll move on now to Anna, who's going to talk about the uh, can Conclusion. So Anna's the Director of Indigo uh, House, and we're uh, delighted to have you here today. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, I'm just going to skip through the conclusions, but concentrate on the, the recommendation. Um, so over the, the three questions that were posed to us in terms of the evidence of enhanced professional practice, yes, we found that um, practice has been enhanced and the letting agent um, sector generally um, has welcomed this, um, this this requirement for qualifications. Obviously, there are uh, some people who have dissented against it, but uh, in general, across those that we surveyed, um, there, there has been support for it. And that it provides a foundation of knowledge and confidence to do the job well. I think it's, it's, it's important to say, though, that that was felt less so for experienced man managers and owners of businesses and decision makers who've been in the industry for a long time, but there was acceptance that there does need to be for those joining um, the the organisation. It's good to have uh, an entry qualification, and over time, the whole a whole of the sector uh, will will be hopefully qualified. Um, there were areas for improvement identified, and I'll come on to those in my in my recommendations in a moment. And in terms of less lessons for the wider sector, stakeholder opinion was in favour of having that generalization of qualification and CPD requirements across all sectors. So that's um, landlords in the private rented sector um, and in the social rented sector. There was a clear support for the social rented sector on the basis that uh, stakeholders felt that there's perhaps more vulnerable tenants in the social rented sector. Um, possibly a bit more mixed opinion for private landlords, but there was a call for equivalence of standards um, and many letting agents said, well, if landlords don't want to qualify, then they should be using qualified agents to uh, let and manage their properties. So in terms of recommendations, specific recommendations, um, generally um, we, we used a, a framework around three pil pillars of professionalism. There's the entry qualification um, with CPD. Then the second element is 
um, sorry, the second element is ongoing um, support for professional practice. So that's CPD. And then the third element of professionalism is complaints and disciplinary mechanisms. And our report set out our recommendations to um, three main um, uh, stakeholders, if you like, Scottish government, training providers, and then the letting agent sector itself. So in relation to, to the first element, which is entry qualification and the second element, CPD, um, we did find that there was areas for improvement, which was coming from um, letting agents, nine different areas, um, and they included combination um, of online and in-person, obviously through the pandemic, everything went online and people are calling for having that kind of hybrid approach so that there is the benefits of that in-person discussion and learning from each other. Um, there is definitely a call for more capacity um, for, for training, particularly for, through the let well um, route, um, because there are limited places for that. Um, ensuring that obviously that it's not just let well, there's um, four different um, routes to getting the qualification in Scotland. And um, there is a call for ensuring that there is relevance for the Scottish PRT in all of these qualifications. Uh, so that it's relevant to Scotland. Um, and on CPD, people want um, uh, a broader range, especially going back to the business owners, decision makers, the senior managers, they want a bit more of a nuanced approach and something that's more relevant to them. Um, it needs to be cognizance of cost. So for smaller letting agents in particular, um, regulation is, is, is you know, comes with the cost and, and that's uh, proportionally greater for smaller agents. Uh, so to, to keep an eye on the cost of CPD and, and thereby increase access to CPD. Um, and then a directory to show um, across the sector what all the CPD um, options are. Uh, so people have, have good um, oversight of that and also a common portal for recording your CPD. Um, many agents talked about the fact that there's a bit of a, 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 a scramble when it comes to re-registration um, at, at the three-year point um, and that it would be useful if there was one place to, to put all of the CPD requirements rather than scrabbling around at the, the end of those three years. Also uh, a need for more CPD training on the first-tier first year tribunal both in terms of technicalities on how to approach the tribunal and take a case to tribunal, but also uh, learning from the case law and the decisions from the tribunal and what agents can learn from that. Also in terms of the wider sector, recommendation to the Scottish government that qualification of the private across the private and social sector should be mandatory. Now, obviously, um, that that is quite quite an undertaking for, for both sectors. Um, so there would need to be time um, uh, in terms of developing that and consultation around that. But in the meantime, the CIH obviously has a role in the short term to encourage the commitment to qualification and to make CPD um, easier to access and easier to, to log that evidence. But again, as I said earlier, the equivalence aspect is being called for by letting agents that if private landlords don't want to qualify, in whatever way, then use a letting agent that is. And finally, in terms of complaints and redress, so obviously our system in Scotland for that is the tribunal. And the recommendation um, to letting agents is that there's an important role there to raise awareness about the tribunal. Many tenants and even landlords don't know about the tribunal and how to make complaints. So there's a, a, a awareness raising job to be done there. For the Scottish Government, a uh, system for identifying unregistered letting agents. So that was a complaint that came up often um, and that there are unregistered agents still active. Um, and the criminal offence aspect of the legislation is seen as disproportionate. People generally won't go to the police and the police may not respond to a complaint about a letting agent. Clearly there's many other priorities. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a call there uh, and a recommendation for some other method and mechanism for calling out unregistered letting agents. And finally, in relation to the Scottish Government and uh, Tribunal uh, call for 
um, also them making public awareness raising about the role of the tribunal. Obviously that has to be balanced with whether the tribunal can respond and um, its workload. Um, but yeah, there needs to be uh, some more awareness raising for that side of things. So people can complain, there is redress, and as a result, the whole system learns. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Um, I, sh I mean, I, I, I presume that the, the audience will have had the opportunity to avail themselves of the, the video, the 10 minute video, which dealt with some of these issues in a little bit more depth, but that's really helpful. Okay, I'd like to start our discussion period now. We've got six or seven minutes to do that. Uh, I'd like to start by asking a really daft question in one, one respect, but one I think this is really kind of important when we think about equivalence and think about other parts of the, the housing system and whether this could be extended, is whether, I mean, in a sense, what is the content for the, 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 the basic qualification and the, and the, and the, C, and the C, C, CPD? And, and to what extent are people happy with the content? Are they, do they think it's the right content? I think that's a, an interesting place to start because that also has implications for how CIH, for instance, might use that knowledge in other learning uh, uh, places, for, for instance. Would either of you like to comment on that? I can, I can start on that. So the content, um, I mean, there's a long list of, of content, but I think um, in my, our recommendations, um, I'm suggesting that it obviously the, the qualification wouldn't exact, be exactly the same across the sector. Um, it needs to be tailored according to the, the part of the sector that you're in. So um, I'm not suggesting and we're not recommending that um, social landlords, for example, undertake the letting agent qualifications. There would need to be a development of what's relevant uh, for the social rented sector. And likewise for private landlords, I think there definitely needs to be a discussion around what's what's relevant for them. The key point is um, that came out from tenants, interestingly, was about risk. Um, and the fact that if if you know if the, the risk is seen to be relevant for letting agents, then why is it, you know, from a tenant's perspective, there's also risk there if somebody who's managing and retaining a property who doesn't have the relevant knowledge and expertise um, for the tenant. I think some, um, some uh, letting agents and landlords suggested, well, it should be associated with the side of, size of portfolio. So if you only have one landlord, uh, one, let, one property, why should, you know, you, really there's not much risk there for the sector. But from the tenant's perspective, there is risk. Yeah. You know, because if, if somebody's not qualified, it doesn't matter whether it's one tenant or 100 tenants, it, for that particular tenant, there is risk. So I think that that's an important point and I think uh, relevant in terms of how we came to the recommendation that there should be qualification across the sector. Yeah, yeah. So then just okay. quite glad to add, you know, qualification is only one part of it, isn't it? It's the CPD. Um, so we are we only have we have one level of qualification and once someone has passed that then that that exists we don't have a we don't have multiple tiers where which is something we could you know we we absolutely can and should be looking at about how those who are ambitious want to have more higher level qualifications however cpd has got to be a core part of it cpd is the bit that kind of reinforces the learning from the qualifications allows you to practice that and i think that's for me that's that's probably quite that's one of the more exciting bits because actually how do you develop broad and deep cpd that matches the changing policy and practitioner landscape because actually we need to have it you know, it's not just about the regulatory and legal requirements as important as they are and they are crucial but when you know, how we focus on the kind of customer service and data management and the breadth of things that you need to deliver high quality customer service so i think I think there's there's a real opportunity for range and expanding that over time. And I, I think Anna's point is absolutely right, but that has to be reflective of different parts of the rent sector. And it also has to be proportionate. And again, it's right, you wouldn't necessarily have the same requirement on an individual landlord as a letting agent, but it doesn't mean you'd have no requirement on them. There's still there's still an expectation around some continual learning because policy and practice moves over time. Therefore, it's it's reasonable absolutely. that practitioners learning moves over time as well. Yeah, and that's right. And, and I guess that longer term view is is about actually creating a kind of e ecosystem to be grand grandiose about it, which which allows for a place to go for 
you know, up to date what CPD is precisely supposed to do to allow people to refresh and update in the context that the, the housing system and policy and practice is changing within. So that's a very important uh, aspect of this. Brilliant. Can I, can I move on to a, a different question, which is something that, you know, we are in cash repeatedly sort of facing as a challenge, which is, is these questions about how you enforce the, the practice of people registering and doing 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 the CPD and being compliant in, in, in a sense. Uh, has there been anything in the in the research we really kind of talked about a little bit, but and also from your thinking, Callum, in, in terms of, of actually trying to make a step change. And there seems to be there seems to be a deficit has been identified in non-compliance and non-registration. Is there is there something which you think is aligned and incentive compatible that might make that might make that le le less of an issue in the future? I don't know. If, uh... I, I think enforce, enforcement is, is hard. I mean, let's be honest, it's, it is it's hard. We've got, I suppose it comes in a few ways. We need to see greater leadership from the sector. Um, we need to see the more people, more organisations and individuals that commit to it, and not just in the letting agent sector, I mean, across the whole housing sector, and the greater expectation there are amongst tenants that there will be requirements there. Um, there is, it is, but it's going to be very vexed and tricky. And, and, you know, the government have communicated other people's rights. You think around the tenancy deposit scheme, there's a lot of fanfare around that when it was introduced and made people really clear around the expectation around private landlords putting deposits into an independent scheme. And I think there has to be much more communication around the expectations that tenants can have around the service they receive from letting agents. That, I don't think, is anywhere to the scale. And I think without that publicity, we're unlikely to see tenants challenge uh, inappropriate actions or lack of uh, qualification requirements. There is, I think Anna's report talks about the sector itself, I think has a role in being much more uh, proactive about this being a kind of a quality mark, actually about ha having this qualification as a badge on it shows as professionalism within there. Yes. Um, and I, I, that's part, you know, obviously we, there's it's a, it's a complex thing around enforcing it, but I think it does, there are things that we can do to, to, to improve that. Yeah, I think just if I could add to that, that um, re-registration re is is the enforcement tool for the letting agent registration and it has to, when you re-register, you have to demonstrate your qualification and your CPD um, and the CPD of 20 hours over three three years that, that has been undertaken. And that is, we know from discussion of Scottish Government, that is, is, is looked at in evidence and some people um, are queried and the Scottish Government goes back to them and asks them, you know, this doesn't look relevant. So there is a discussion. So there is enforcement for those who have registered. And that, that's a problem. If you have, if, if letting agents haven't registered, um, then that, that, that's where the issue uh, falls yes. down and um, there is a potential gap there. Um, but yeah, there is a mechanism there that exists to make sure that those that have registered are doing doing my training and their CPD. Yes. Uh, I'm just thinking about, we'll have to move on in a second, but I'm just thinking about one of the comments that's been made in the Q&A, which is, you know, reflecting on previous webinars we've done where, where you know, people have made comments that some people don't recognise that as a private landlord, they are a private landlord. They don't, mm. they don't even view it as a, a business. And I guess that must be much less likely in the letting agency world, but it's still conceivable, I suppose, that a a minority of people will not recognise their, you know, their the mandatory nature of of, of what's been what's being uh, yeah. uh, uh, discussed, and that one, hope, one hopes is something that part of professionalisation's job is to try to, you know, gradually shift that the, the flow of 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 uh, 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 qualified and registered uh, like agents uh, overwhelms the, those that are not. In, in, in yeah, I agree. I mean, right, that was well, point, yeah. sorry, just, uh, just on that, but you said, you know, even if you are a landlord with one property, that there's still that risk to that one tenant, even if it's not sector-wide fundamental risk. And that is, that comes, you know, whether you are holding one property or thousands, actually, you're still responsible for the, yeah. the home that someone lives in. And that yes. that is inherent uh, in your responsibility, which makes you a housing professional if you, whether you choose to reflect that or recognise that or not. Great. Thank you both very, very much. Okay, we're now going to move on to the second section of our, our discussion. So thank you to both Anna and Callum. And I'll now uh, invite, uh, make sure I get the right people on, Lorna and uh, Neil to join us uh, if they could turn on their cameras. Uh, thank you, you're both there, it's good to see you. So Lorna and uh, 
and I'm struggling here with my, my memory, Lorna and Neil are both can speak for five minutes about specific aspects of their response to the report. And I'll, I'll just briefly in, introduce you and give you a chance to introduce yourselves a bit, bit more. So L Lorna Dunsmore, uh, Dunmore works for uh, CURB, which is part of LINK. And, okay. and uh, uh, Neil uh, works for Omega Lettings, which I believe is based in, in Edinburgh. So you're, you're both going to uh, tell us a bit more about that, but actually use your five minutes to, 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 to respond to reports you see fit. So Lorna, I'll just hand straight over to you. Thank you, Ken. Um, in terms of the standout points and research for me, I have to say, first of all, I was absolutely delighted when letting agent registration and regulation came in. Having worked within the enforcement arm of a local authority, dealing with the worst of the private rented sector in terms of poor practices by both private landlords and letting agents, I had seen firsthand some of the risks of not complying with the, the, the legal framework around uh, tenant rights. So I was delighted when that legislation came in because by then I had spent a bit of time working in, in that area of a local authority, a bit of time in social housing. Um, I had done my, my housing MSc and then I was working for uh, the part of Link Group which runs private residential tenancies and uh, manages as a letting agent uh, private properties as well. So I knew that minimum qualifications empower people to solve problems. I had seen it firsthand and I definitely saw it within the team that I ran that was responsible for managing over a thousand private tenancies now um, and over 1800 privately owned uh, units as letting agent. So it definitely empowers people to solve problems. It gives people the confidence that they understand the legal framework that they are responsible for upholding. And I think that the continuing professional development allows practice exchange, which is different from just having knowledge of the legal framework. I think it's really important that you have the opportunity to speak with professionals within the sector about the different ways in which you can develop processes for your organisation to implement the law. Um, and I definitely think that that has led to improved practices, more efficient ways of working, cut down on problems. And that's really what professionalism is all about. If you want to, to introduce a, a change, I think it needs to be worthwhile. And this one certainly has been from my point of view. I don't think it's the the be all and end all. I do think that MSc diploma um, and management qualifications still have a place over and above this from both within um, the letting agency sector and the wider housing sector. I think the second point for me was around um, the issue of should the training be compulsory across all the sectors? For me, it should be. I don't think it should be left to chance whether your landlord understands the legislation that they're responsible for implementing. Um, I do think that the training as a minimum for private landlords without agents and social landlords, managerial staff should be around what are the tenancy rights? What are the key risks around unsafe houses, illegal evictions and uh, tenancy rights where there are breaches of tenancy that could result in homelessness, making sure people get support there. Um, and I think the other element of ensuring that you've got training and CPD opportunities is around not just those responsible for implementing it, but also those responsible for enforcing it. So what training and CPD requirements are there for local authority enforcement staff, Scottish Government, First Year Tribunal, police, and other professionals who might be working within the sector and part of the sort of general way in which tenancy rights are upheld, how, how is it that we make sure that those professionals get the training and CPD that they need to be able to really make tenant rights real? Um, and I think when it comes to redress, I wouldn't be particularly in favour of a very expensive sort of all tenure regulatory inspection report uh, approach. I think it really needs to be around the risks and raising awareness from both a professional and a tenancy perspective using social media a wee bit more as well and doing that within the, the sort of general uh, climate of having quite tight resources within the public sector and not wanting to add too much of a cost burden but whilst really seeing the benefit of additional 
uh, learning and awareness uh, to, to actually solving problems and reducing some of the waste that comes with um, a lack of knowledge and understanding. So for me, it was a very positive piece of research and hopefully something that really enables the housing sector to move forward. Thank you very much, Lana. That's great and certainly sparked some ideas in my head that we can discuss in a few minutes. OK, shall we move over to Neil? Thank, thank you. Yeah, hi, Ken. Um, my name's Neil. I'm a director of a company called Umega Lettings in Edinburgh. We're a private letting agency. Um, I started the business uh, just over 15 years ago. So I've been working you know, in the sector uh, from before um, the requirement came in for, for qualifications uh, and all the way through up to now. And, um, it was it was great reading the report. You know, working working in the sector, kind of day in day out, you um, you you don't easily see the progress that that's being made. And I think what was really eye opening for me and really helpful about reading the report is just sort of stepping back and just seeing how how far things have come. And and that's not just you know myself feeling that as somebody who's working in the sector, but but that's really come out from everyone else who was involved in the research. So. The, uh, I think the reason that the minimum requirement around qualifications and CPD was brought in was, was just to create, uh, was to raise the floor on the sector. It was to put a level of professionalism, minimum professionalism into the, the letting agent sector. So that's, it looks like that's been achieved. But for me, there's there's some, there's some bigger gains. There's some additional bonuses in there um, around uh, specifically around CPD and, and career progression and, and professionalism. So we employ a lot of people within the business. We, we employ directly just over 50 people at Umega. And um, since the qualifications has, has come along and the CPD has had to improve and the, uh, the providers, the qualification providers have raised their game because there are now more and more people going through the qualifications, um, it's created a community and it's created a, a pathway for people to um, have careers in, in the letting agent sector that, that wasn't really there before. So um, from my from the position I'm in trying to attract people into the business, usually from outside of the sector, we're, we're trying to bring people in from all sorts of customer service backgrounds. Um, the fact that they can build a career here and there's a, there's a pathway to get qualifications and better professionalism and there's a community of people who are in the sector who are all studying and learning together as we're navigating um, challenges around the market conditions, around customer service, or around changing legisl legislation uh, is a real benefit. It's really attractive um, to people who are considering a career or, or a job in letting. So I think that's been a that's been a terrific kind of byproduct as a result of bringing in the the qualification, the CPD requirement, and that's um, that's been. We kind of we can see the benefit of that now playing out over over the last few years, and I think it's I think we're an exciting we're at an exciting stage because the the providers of the CPD and the qualifications I think are are raising their game. You know I think they've got plans for what they want to do next. I know there's a lot in the report about different standards of qualification now, rather than just a one size fits all. It's looking at people at different levels of experience at different levels within different businesses and and how. Uh, CPD and qualifications can be can be geared towards them a little bit better, which, which I think is really exciting. It just adds to that um, those that idea of a pathway, a career pathway, and progression within a role within a business, which is uh, which is terrific. I, I also really liked in the report um, how it was broader than just looking at the qualifications. This idea of looking at professionalism uh, with three pillars, um, I thought was uh, was really interesting. And the what came out for me as well was how the professionalism in the sector, so the, the introduction of qualifications and, and CPD has, has done a lot to improve the, the standards and the professionalism in the sector, but it's been held back now. And there's two areas that get pulled out in the report specifically. One is around the enforcement of people and agencies that are not meeting the requirements and, and that probably not enough is being done there uh, to, to enforce those that aren't meeting the requirements. And the other one is the the access and the capacity of the redress system in the first tier tribunal. And that's something that we, you know, we have a lot of frustration with in our day to day, but it's really come out in the report as well that it's um, the first tier tribunal isn't really working for a lot of people. Uh, and that's around capacity or, or access to it and how, and how easily people can, can access redress. Um, there's also something there about the power imbalance between uh, landlords and tenants and properties and, and whether tenants, even if they know about the first year tribunal, how reluctant they are to, to maybe activate it because of repercussions it might have on their own 
their own situations. So there's a there's a lot to be done around um, how we're going to enforce or how the requirements should be enforced, um, and then how people can access redress and, and, and get protection. I guess within the system, and, and without those without um, improvements being made in those two areas, uh, there's it, there's probably only so far we can go with the professionalisation and the rest of the sector and requirements and, and that kind of thing. And just the last thing I'll say, uh, Ken, just before before I'm out of time, is there was the the recommendations in the report are, are terrific. There's one there's uh, there's one about how all private landlords should be should be made to get the qualification. Um, and I understand that from a you know from trying to give a tenant tenants a consistent experience, but we are at a really precarious time in the in the private. Uh, rented sector at the moment um, where there is just way more demand certainly in Edinburgh and I think this is true across all of Scotland way more demand from prospective tenants than there are available properties and uh, bringing in a, a qualification requirement on private landlords now who I think make up about 50 percent of the properties in the private rented sector uh, is probably going to discourage more landlords out of the sector and it's just trying to understand what the knock-on effects of that that might be if that recommendation gets followed up. Thank you very much, both of you. Lorna, could you come back on the on the screen? Uh, just so we can have a wee, a wee uh, just discussion. I thought both of your contributions were really interesting and quite different, but actually both uh, with a, a large degree of, of positive. This is a great opportunity and it's already making positive change. Can we maybe start with you, Lorna? I'd like to ask you a slightly left field question, if that's okay. But I mean, in listening to what you're saying and your your experience from both social and the private rental sector, do you think there is a mutual two way benefit between uh, social renting professionals working in the private rental sector and sort of learning from the what goes on in the private sector, the expectations of people in that? Having a sort of feedback into what social landlords do as well is there is there so is there a wider rental benefit from people understanding how the different parts of of, of what's required in in these different parts of the re re rental sector does that make sense? Absolutely, I, I think that having practice exchange forums that allow people to share a diverse range of experience and professional experience of implementing legislation and tenancy rights is absolutely beneficial both operationally and in terms of opening up thought around policy and future legislation. So from a mid-market rent uh, development point of view, many people within registered social landlords moved from the social rented sector into the private rented sector and uh, within our organisation we actually put the staff through the letting agency qualification, even if they already had a Chartered Institute of Housing qualification, because it's a different legal framework. But nevertheless, they brought rich experience to that. So it certainly is beneficial to have that broader knowledge. And for staff who work within a local authority setting, it might involve being both a landlord and an organisation that does strategic um, housing planning and uh, enforcement, then certainly having knowledge of the tenancy rights within both sectors is vital. Great. Thank you for that. I was very struck also by what you said about the benefits of enforcement officers understanding what the what the content of the of the CPD, et cetera, actually was and how that helps them in their relationship working with their letting agents and land, landlords. Neil, if, if I could turn to you, I, I was, again, really struck by some, some of the things you, you, you uh, said, um, particularly around the market context, demand being greater than supply, rents going going up, the shortages in, in the market, and, and, and the value that, that that kind of professionalism and training can bring. What, one of the comments, one of the questions in the QA box is making the points that you know that, that 20 hours over three three years just isn't enough to to achieve what one would want to achieve. And I know you were talking about the different scales of of provision that's available, but but is there is there a sweet spot? Is there is there a right kind of level for for this? And 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 is is there a kind of cost cost ceiling on this that that, that letting agents would find un, 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 unacceptable if it went went beyond that? In terms of the CPD, in terms of the cost yeah. of CPD qualifications, yeah, I, I think 
I don't think the twenty hours is, is is unreasonable. I think that's a I think that's a that's a good minimum requirement to put on to put on agencies. I think where what we struggle with sometimes is understanding what qualifies and what doesn't. You know, when we went through our re registration process here, um, yeah, we you know we submitted a, a whole load of development and and training that we've been through over the last three years, and and some of that got sent back and saying no, this. We're not going to accept this. Can you send us something else? And and that was yeah. why we we were able to do that and go and dig out the the courses and the you know the booking forms and things that we've been on over the years. Um, but I think it would really help agencies uh, when we know in advance if we're signing up for something and we're planning our development for the year. You know, we're sitting down with our team or when we're when we're doing our own. Um, personal development and you're looking ahead at the rest of the year and the things you're going to attend or the or the uh you know the webinars you're going to do online courses and that kind of thing um what's relevant and what's not you know what's qualifies and what doesn't i think that'd be really helpful there's there's definitely some confusion on our part at the moment and and i, I know it's also an important where you could log cpd and track where, where you are and that would be really helpful. There isn't. Um, we're members of our, our property mark, which allow you to do that on their portal. But um, the Scottish government don't have access to that, and there isn't a centralised place that we can go to to, to kind of log uh, log stuff that they that they can see or track ourselves or know what our team are doing. You know, we all have to do that on our own softwares. And and again, that's fine, except the stuff that we think is going to qualify doesn't qualify as far as Scottish government is concerned. So they could definitely give us a hand there. I think with that stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Absolutely. And actually, you know, we in the university are suppliers of housing education. And in the past, we've converted some of our courses into CPD mod, mod, modules for, for these sorts of uh, re reasons. And it's, it's something also that perhaps uh, the uh, and the providers of these kind of CPD courses are obviously not not just uh, the four people already doing it. And, and, and those universities have got a link to CIH. There's lots of other people who could potentially provide this stuff if there's a way of approving, you know, those sorts, sorts of courses. Brilliant. Th th thanks very much. If you don't mind, I'm going to move straight on to the third uh, set of uh, this, this, this discussion. So thanks very much to both Lorna and Neil. And I'm going to straight, move straight on to invite Timothy and Matthew to join us. That's okay. So, uh, Timothy... Uh, Douglas uh, is works for Pro Pro Property Mark, of course, one, one of the uh, providers of the of this of the CPD uh, uh, training, and uh, Matthew works for Kingdom Ho Housing Association. So again, you've been asked to reflect and report on its findings from specific perspectives. Uh, so maybe if I could ask Timothy to go go first. Thank you, Ken. Um... And good morning, everyone, and thank you to Callum and the CIH for the, for inviting us to be involved in the project and inviting to to speak today. Um, yes, I think um, you know some reflections straight away from the report. I mean, from Property Mark's perspective, we're a um, professional body which performs a, a regulatory function amongst our members. We've got over five hundred uh, letting agent members in in Scotland. Uh, and up to 17,000 agents, members across across the UK. So we've long campaigned for, you know, greater regulation for letting agents. So I think it has, as has been said by the other speakers, you know, the Scottish Government have really sort of led the way uh, in steps through, through uh, the register qualification uh, and also the requirement for client money protection, mandatory client money protection, which I think could form part of uh, the enforcement arm as well, the checks and balances um, on agents. Um, so I think, you know, from our point of view, ensuring agents should be qualified, they meet minimum competency standards, you know, that is the way to drive up standards um, and, and the service for consumers and essentially eliminate bad practice uh, in the sector. So I think it was pleasing, you know, to see 80% of letting agents from the report who had done the qualification said um, it had a positive impact on their professional capabilities. I think that is a really high uh, observation. And I think the other figure that stood out for me was 51% of landlords said that the requirement for a letting agent qualification had been a positive thing for the sector overall. So, you know, over just over half of landlords. I think there's no doubt some of the implications of the report, I think, um, has as has been alluded to by other speakers as well, I think we certainly agree with that principle of housing education across all 10 years, um, you know, to 
for all for investment and endorse all housing um, professionals. And we know that, um, you know, from the Scottish government's rented strategy, there is a push for equivalence. So I think that that is a, a theme that, that's coming through. Um, other implications? Well, I definitely think, as as has been said, you know, focus on being a letting agent as a career, you know, with a professional qualification. I think there's a figure, 84 percent of respondents said that, you know, positive for the sector overall, improve, you know, to improve the standards and the reputation of the sector. So we're now beginning to see, um, you know, as Neil was alluded to, people looking at being a letting agent as a as a profession, as a career, as something they want to be qualified and maintain that qualification throughout um, you know, their, their, their life, as it were, their working life. But I think the other implication, of course, is uh, there was cost, you know, came through uh, as a barrier. And that's obviously got to be um, uh, balanced with, with future future changes. I think what's needed or next steps, I mean, no doubt about it, the CPD has come up and a portal um, or some way of, of logging that. And I think um, definitely as a professional body, you know, uh, any professional body that has CPD requirements, we have that as part of our membership. That needs to be joined up with um, the Scottish Government. As Ken and you were alluded to, we provide training. We've got two training courses on the tribunal, uh, cases and how to prepare. So they need to be, you know, we're working with, with the Scottish Government and Rentsmart Wells as well to ensure that our regular training is accredited and joined up. And I think all providers um, there, there's work to be done, that, done there. I think from the recommendations, looking at landlords being qualified, I think there's probably a step to maybe saying for those landlords who are fully managing property, do we need to level the playing field or do we have a, a level of qualification or training depending on um, what that landlord is doing, you know, and the role of the, the agent. Um, I think making training accessible for people definitely come through uh, in the recommendations we've done, uh, we're now moving at Property Mart to remote invigilation. You know, don't have to go to a test centre. Um, you can do that at home or at work um, and making use of technology, really, to to ensure that that process is secure. Um, but people can do it you know, when they want. And I think that's that's really um, important. And just to two other um, points, I think um, there was. Definitely from the recommendations around enforcement and the compliance. And again, I think there's a role for professional bodies and other providers in, in the sector, such as, you know, the CMP schemes, the tenancy deposit schemes, professional bodies. You know, we've definitely moved to uh, beefing up our compliance function. We have a calm about compliance um, agenda where we're, we've got a team going out into agents' offices, working with our, our members to ensure that they are um you know, meeting all their, their requirements. So again, I definitely think there is partnership that Scottish Government need to do with providers um, and, and the professional bodies in the sector. And of course, you know, finally, it's up to that, the agent, once you are qualified, and I'm sure Neil would, would um, you know, back this up, is, you know, it's a bad, you know, use it as a badge of honour, you know, um, it get, when you're engaging with, with landlords, we've done a lot of work, trust the expert, you know, you as an agent, and uh, you as a member of professional body have been qualified, do regular training, you really use that as a marketing tool uh, with landlords and, and tenants to you know, set yourself um, above from the rest, but also that, that uh, a real, real badge, badge of honour. So that's just some observations, Ken, um, on the report. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Tim. Okay, I'm going to move straight on to Matthew. Thanks, Ken, and uh, thanks everyone for inviting me along this morning. Um, yeah, so I, I work for, for Kingdom Housing Association. Um, We're a social landlord, but we also have a, a, a fairly significant mid-market rent operation, uh, which sits within the PRS framework. So we've got the, had the benefit of, of seeing a, a division of our organisation go through the, you know, the mandatory qualifications on the PRS side as, as well, and then observing how that translates across and some internal cross-learning cross, cross learning that's, that, that's taken place already. Um, reading through the, through the port, I think it's very welcome speaks positively about the impact of enhanced professionalism um, within the within the private rent sector here specifically but then I think the, some of the recommendations about cross-sector approach are, 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 are welcomed as 
well and the questions are about how we then take some of those take some of those forward and um, it's really encouraging to see the positive reflection from landlords within the report about the direction of travel as well i think um you know just as a, a, a sense that is something that has been adopted by the sector and seen as a positive positive step um obviously against the backdrop of housing build this year and there's been other speakers have talked about whole rented sector i think it does make sense to talk about cross sector cross sector learning here and let's visit it'd be remiss not to not not to re reflect on that and see what we can do to develop um, all all parts of the sector and i think from reflecting on the social housing element in particular um and and, and noting the comment in the report around the fact that sort of the the, the, the governance uh, complaints disciplinary stuff that's already in place on the social side through through SPSO SHR um, in, in engagement and assurance I think the, the two things that stick out for me are around the, the qualifications and CPD pillars of, of professionalism and um, the, the CPD element if we take that and um, it's been really interesting hearing some of the other comments talking about the, the accessibility of, of CPD what some of the barriers might be but the, but the report clearly sets out the, the, the benefits of CPD, and I would say that reflects what what we see as an organisation where staff are empowered through continuous engagement, developing their own professional approach, and that feeding through to, to customer service and the, and the way that the way that people um, go, go about their go about their work. Um, I think there is an element around around CPD that I would pick up, and it's similar to others where understanding what what qualifies in terms of the, the the framework for cpd would be useful um i think there's possibly discussion there about um how cpd can be proactively driven um to address maybe some of the barriers like like cost or accessibility and there's maybe an ongoing sector-wide discussion there about exactly who, who are the providers who can take on accredited cpd delivery um, i think that's that's something that could be could be expanded and that would work across across both both parts of the, of the of the sector um in terms of the professional qualifications absolutely our experience has, has been as with the report that the staff undertaking the and it's stuff went through the let well qualification um, within within kingdom but that has provided demonstrable benefit additional knowledge and has supported staff in their day-to-day -day work um with a, in reflecting on the recommendation about qualification across the sector um i think it, it one of the main benefits about the the, the, the PRS qualification was that it specialised around around the, the, the tenure around around PRS. I think one of the questions for me, just thinking about the, the rollout in social housing side, is that there can be a bit more fragmentation within organisations. So I think there's a bit of discussion to develop what a framework looks like not just the, the hierarchy but also maybe the differentiation of roles within particularly bigger social landlords what is an appropriate qualification um you know so we've got people doing the right things and it's supporting their specific avenue what what does a prof professional qualification look like for this type of role i think if we're going to go down the the, the mandatory route i think we need to understand that that framework so that that's something that people can be can be clear about um and i think that's that that's that's the hurdle that we'd want to cross before we got to the mandatory bit that that said i think whether whether professional qualifications are mandatory or whether they are brought in because it is seen as the right thing to do that recommendation is absolutely something that should be should be progressed i think there is a a question in terms of you know, delivery of this of, of the the drivers Callum had mentioned earlier about leadership within the within the sector. I think there is a, an element of this. Um, so both both of, of of leaders within housing organisations, but also in representative bodies, CIH in there, but but government regulator in there as well. We're looking for equivalence of of professionalism across the sector. Well, what are the standards we're setting out, and how how do we how do we portray to to people across the sector that those are the standards that we should be aspiring to because they are the right thing to do to deliver for tenants, residents, customers, and the, and the, and the people who are living in our properties. Um, advocacy, 
ties in with that. And I think there is a role within the social housing sector. I think this, where, where the social housing sector is just now, I think is possibly a different starting point to where PRS was at the start of, of, the, of the journey with qualifications coming in. There are, you look around, you see stories about organisations who invest heavily in, in qualifications and CPD. What you don't see is where that's not happening. Um, and and I, would, I would like to think that if we apply the framework now, that a, lo- a large number of landlords would fit within that framework without too much difficulty. But let's, let's not make assumptions or be complacent about that. I think, I think that's, that's something that needs to be explored. I think build it on that sort of advocacy leadership stuff. There are roles to cons- consider in here for all, all stakeholders within, within the social housing framework of actually what's the expectation so if you're a board member what should you be looking for your organization to be showing you we we, we complete an assurance statement every year that says that we're running the, the business in compliance with all the governance requirements for the for the housing regulator we, we could add something in there about education cpd professionalism and um, what, what's the regulator looking for what's the government looking for what are tenants looking for and how transparent are we with tenants I would be brave enough to start asking them about the value of training and what that's delivering from them at the front line as well. Maybe maybe that's not one for today, but I think there is. So there is that sense of if we get the whole sector talking about it, advocating it, we will see some progression, whether or not it's mandatory in the first place. Thank you very much. That was really excellent, and thanks to both both of you for your your comments and a number of the same points come coming up about accessibility and cost. This idea of the framework leadership. Etc. Uh, all very helpful. I'd like to ask you just one question, uh, given the time we've got. What one of the one of the overarching objectives of the report was really to ask whether, at this point, taking account of the first wave of of the training, do you think there are demonstrable outcomes that have improved? Up, uh, you know that we could say, well, that because of that, we've now got a better letting uh, agency say sector can we say that with con- confidence and why would either of you like to respond i think definitely you can for, i mean from the stats that that i said you know the, the high 80s into the 90s some of the percentages uh of of who the the, the report interviewed have definitely said you know it's they feel more professional they feel more competent they feel like um you know, you know, empowered almost to, to do their role as a letting agent. And then I think you're beginning to see uh, the landlords, um, you know, if, if over or roughly around 50% of landlords are saying that uh, the requirements have been a positive thing, then I think that that's a good start, you know, yeah. and, and we're only, you know, um, years in or, or the first, you know, the first cycle. So, um, so definitely, I think we're on a positive directory and it has had a positive impact based on, you know, the, the percentages in the report. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, Matt? What, what, yeah, what you well, I'm going to echo, echo those thoughts. I think there's, so, so are, we, are, we, are we somewhere down the track to, to what, what the measures were set out to achieve? I would say yes. Um, does that does that mean that we've got to the end point? No, um, and I guess it's that having that 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 perspective. There is, there are positive reflections coming through the report that we see. I think there's 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 positive evidence that we see anecdotally um, around around the sector, and I do mean across across the set, you know, public and social and and private sector. There, um, as I say, from from my direct experience, we've seen some of the considerations particularly around the cpd evidencing on the the the, the prs side within our operation influencing thinking about how we manage that and support staff in other parts of the business and i think you know on on that basis and having heard similar stories from other um social landlords who are managing multi-tenure stock in that way you know you can reasonably extrapolate that there's a there's a positive direction of travel there Great. No, that's that's fantastic. Thanks for that. I'm afraid we're just about out of time, so I think I probably better just wrap up. So thank thank the two of you for your contribution and also for our other speak, speakers today. I'd like to thank Charter Institute of Housing for making all of this possible and uh, Anna, of course, for uh, leading on the report. I'd also like to thank Gareth James from Cash, who's been sort of behind the scenes doing all the bits and bobs to make all of this work and has done all the preparatory work for, for, for the event. I mean, I, I just left with two kind of final points, I suppose. One is that 
a, a repeated theme this morning has been this kind of systemic le level, the rented sector, the housing system as a whole, and that these uh, this notion of equivalence is, is is about trying to 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 set a minimum standard for all letting activities, regardless of who does it, in, in, in a sense, at one level. And that's that's a really interesting uh, thing to, to to start from. You know, how, how how do we how do we overcome the barriers to, to that? How how can we move forward to make some of the other parts of the system, which might be themselves barriers to what we're trying to do here with uh, the the let 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 letting functions? We've heard about some of the challenges created by the lack of capacity in enforcement, the lack of capacity in the first tier tribunal. So, system but it strikes me that what's really encouraging is that this isn't about this isn't about trying to improve things for the benefit of the supply side to improve you know the the the, the, the opportunities for sub, sub suppliers of agency services and landlordism it's clearly about professionalism for its own its own sake as well that here's an opportunity to create a more professionalized uh, business sector and, and not-for-profit sector at, at the same time to improve standards and quality and to re reduce risk. Uh, and that's, you know, that I found that very, very in, in encouraging. So it looks like progress has been made. There is a lot of way to go yet, but people are really grass, gr grappling with, with the issues that, that are emerging in a positive and constructive way. So thank you all very, very much. We'll end the event at that point and look forward to uh, seeing you at, fu at future events uh, that, that will come over the next few months. So th th thanks a lot and cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.